Hello everyone and welcome to the Silver Screen Newsroom. I'm Star and boy do we got a lot of news this time. So let's get to it. Last episode I talked a little bit about Star Wars. Well, even in this short of time since then, we have even more news about it. First off, probably one of the biggest news is that Episode 7 officially has a writer. It is Michael Ardent. He was the screenwriter for Toy Story 3 and Little Miss Sunshine, both wonderful films. Based on those two films alone, I feel confident in this writer for the new Star Wars film. Let's hope he's a fan as well. But what about a director? Any news on that yet? Sadly, not at the moment. However, I can give you a at least one name who has prominently said he will not direct the Star Wars franchise, Steven Spielberg. He's flat out said, no, no, it's not my genre, the director explained, it's my best friend George's genre. Steven, I respect you for staying loyal to your friend, but how can you say Star Wars, a sci-fi action film, isn't your genre? What about AI artificial intelligence or close encounters of the third kind? I appreciate and respect your loyalty to your friend, but come on now, Steve, not your genre. Though there will be, in my opinion, a lot of pressure for the person who is decided to direct the first new Star Wars film since 2005. Again, we are stuck waiting, kids. Finally, in regards to Star Wars, apparently there is a rumor going around that Darth Vader will be returning in Episode 7. What?! Okay, first off, he's dead. Unless he comes talking to Luke like Obi-Wan, I don't see how this is going to happen, let alone work out. I mean, I know Darth Vader is one of the most popular characters of the series and villains of all time, but really? Plus, he's had his time. Basically, more or less, he's had six films revolving around him. Ish. No, Vader doesn't need to come back. This was brought to the World Wide Web's attention through an article from ScreenRant.com that a mole within the production, well that's fucking amazing considering they just got a damn writer for it, said Episode 7 creative team considers Vader integral to Star Wars. The anonymous source claims, the plan is for Darth Vader to return and play a significant role in the new films. Look, I like Vader, he was a really cool character, but there is no way I see this happening, and unless they do something completely amazing with him, I, I don't see him coming back. Moving on, Transformers 4. Yep, you heard me right. There is going to be a fourth film to the series, and yes, Michael Bay will be producing and directing it. Bay has said, The movie is going to continue four years on from the attack on Chicago, which was in the last movie. No shit. So it's going to still have the same lineage, but going in a full new direction, and it actually feels really natural how it is going in that direction. So for all of you who couldn't stand Shia LaBeouf, congrats! You now get Mark Wahlberg! I'm not sure what Mark will be playing in this new film, and possibly new trilogy of films for the series, but many think he will be playing some type of military character. Whether you are praising the change in cast or screaming, never mind, Shia wasn't that bad, you'll have to wait till June 29th, 2014, when T4 should be hitting theaters. And now to get this bit out of the way, for you Twilight fans, there is talk of a TV series spin-off. Nothing is definite, so stop your screaming and breathe. It's just something floating around, apparently. Meanwhile, the end to the Twilight series of films, The Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2, opened in theaters November 16th. Now, on to some oldie but goodie news. Who here saw Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Okay, one, two, three, four. Now, how many of you wanted a sequel? One, two, three, four, five. Five? Dave, how can you want a sequel if you never saw it? Because shut up, that's why. Okay, okay. Well, for the ones who said yes, myself included, we may just get that chance. Robert Zemeckis, the director of the now 1988 cult classic film, while promoting his film Flight, teased, saying, I have a Roger Rabbit sequel script at Disney, and we're just waiting for all the executive changes to settle down there. No clue what it's going to be about, but how can a sequel be made when Bob Hoskins, who played Eddie Valiant, the lovable detective, is retired? Hoskins announced on August 8th of this year he's retiring from acting due to his ongoing battle with Parkinson's disease. I mean, sure, you could have a new set of characters, but eh, sometimes you want the classics as they were, you know? Speaking of classics, that brings us to our last piece of news. There is a potential chance, with a script already written, that the classic film Casablanca will be getting a sequel as well. It's 70 years later. Do you think it could work? Do you even think it's needed? Yahoo News gave a small pros and cons list to the sequel. Pros! The script is by the original film's writer, Howard Koch. God, I hope I'm saying that right. 
The original left everyone wanting more. Cons. Stars of the sequel will be under a microscope. That's certain. And those famous one-liners can't be matched. Now, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of backlash for this, being the movie buff I am, but I have to admit I've never actually seen Casablanca. I know, I know, I just never really thought about it, but I've seen others, like All About Eve and The Women, so... Yeah. So, since I haven't seen the film, I can't give too much of an opinion about how I feel of a potential sequel, but I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. Let's move over to trivia. Now, I was really stumped on what movie to do trivia on this time, since no one has left a comment suggesting one. Hint, hint. So seeing how its fifth installment is coming out next year with A Good Day to Die Hard, let's look at the original Die Hard. It came out in 1988, was directed by John McTiernan, and stars Bruce Willis, Alan Rickman, and Reginald Bell Johnson. Now, this film has a lot of trivia to it. Some repetitive, so forgive me for not letting you know all of it, or we'll be here all day. So, here are the biggest, slash, most interesting bits. First off, it was Alan Rickman's feature debut film. Deputy Chief Robinson says that John McClane could be a fucking bartender, for all we know. Prior to becoming a well-known actor, Willis was a bartender. This was based on a book by Roderick Thorpe entitled Nothing Lasts Forever, a sequel to another book entitled The Detective, which in 1968 was made into a film starring Frank Sinatra. Because of a clause in Sinatra's contract for The Detective, which gave him the right to reprise his role in a sequel, he was actually the first person offered the McLean role, even though he was 73 years old at the time. Also, coincidentally, Bruce Willis made his film debut in The First Deadly Sin, walking out of a bar as Sinatra walks into it. Many other actors were offered or considered for the role before Willis. It originally went to, now stay with me here, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Burt Reynolds, Richard Gere, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson, and apparently Robert De Niro turned it down, as well as Tom Berenger and even Nick Nolte before Willis got it. Did, did you keep up with me? In the making of featurette, John McTiernan revealed that a vast majority of the exterior shots of the building showing explosions were real, full-scale explosions set off in and around the actual building. Hart Bachner's line, Hans, Bobby, was ad-libbed. Alan Rickman's quizzical reaction was genuine. The Nakatomi Tower is actually the headquarters of 20th Century Fox. The company charged itself rent for the use of the then-unfinished building. How do you charge yourself rent? In the scenes where John McClane is required to run through a multitude of glass shards in his bare feet after Hans has his men shoot out the glass partitions in the computer room, Bruce Willis is in fact wearing special rubber shoes designed to look like his own bare feet. One can in fact see this if looking closely at his feet. They appear quite unnaturally large in some of the crucial barefoot scenes. So there you go. Bruce Willis was the original Hobbit. Ha! For the shot where Hans Gruber falls from the top of the building, Alan Rickman was actually falling from a 21-foot high model. He was holding onto a stuntman and falling onto an airbag. To get the right reaction, the stuntman dropped Rickman on the count of two, not three. And finally, a small director trademark for John McTiernan, a teddy bear. McLean has a teddy bear for his family. Jack Ryan takes the teddy bear home with him at the end of the hunt for Red October. It's the same bear. Fuck, that's a lot! And that's not even all of it. Damn! Onward to coming attraction. This coming attraction is Hitchcock. Let's watch. All of us harbor dark recesses of violence and horror. I'm just a man hiding in the corner with a camera, watching. Mr. Hitchcock, you're the most famous director in the history of the medium, but you're 60 years old. Shouldn't you just quit while you're ahead? This is murder. I'm getting blisters just watching you. He's going out of his mind looking for his next project. I need something fresh, something different. It was the knife that, a moment later, cut off her scream and her head. <laughs> Charming. Doris Day should do it as a musical. Good afternoon. This book, Psycho, is fiendishly entertaining. Is this really going to be your next picture? Yes, madam. By the way, try the finger sandwiches. They're real fingers. No one respects the name Hitchcock more than Paramount. But even a talented man sometimes backs the wrong horse. This is Mr. Hitchcock's next film. 
Fine. If you can get the money. Who do I make it out to? Well, are we going to have to sell the whole house or just the pool? You are intrigued, aren't you? Killing off your leading lady halfway through the movie. How are you going to shoot this shower scene? It's only that, well, from here up, I'm not exactly boyish. You shouldn't wait till halfway through. Kill her off after 30 minutes. Wow. After letting him do something so tasteless, don't upset yourself, darling. It's only a bloody movie. More anger! More! <laughs> married to a man obsessed by murder. This will not be released in this country. Show me some damn footage now! I'm under extraordinary pressures on this picture, and the least you could do is give me your full support! We've mortgaged our house! I am your wife. I celebrate with you when the reviews are good, I cry for you when they are bad, and I put up with those people who look through me as if I were invisible, because all they can see is the great and glorious genius Alfred Hitchcock. I promised Mother I wouldn't tell. Oh, you imp, you've got nudity in there. Well, her breasts were rather large. It was a challenge not to show them. This has me excited because one, Anthony Hopkins. Two, Helen Mirren. Three, this looks fun. It's like a docu-movie thing. I'm sure things are exaggerated or expanded, but this looks fun to me. It's like a behind-the-scenes thing that was so good they had to make a film of it. Plus, Anthony and Helen are amazing actors. To see them together, I think, is going to be just awesome. So check it out when it comes to theaters November 23rd. Finally, we come to the end of SSNR with Q&A. We have our first and only question <coughs> via Twitter from Miss Jessie to you. Thank you again, Jess. What is the different functions between a blue screen and a green screen? Now, I'll even admit when I was asked this question, I had a smart-ass reply of, Duh, the colors. But actually, when I went looking this up, there is a bit more to this than that. Chroma keying, the technical term of using a green or any color background, is a very interesting thing, actually. First off, a green or blue screen is normally used because these colors are considered to be the furthest away from skin tone. So your actor doesn't get lost in the effect. We will demonstrate now. Now you see skin, and now you don't. Okay, put me back now. Green is currently used as a backdrop more than any other color because image sensors in digital video cameras are most sensitive to green due to the Bayer pattern, allocating more pixels to the green channel, mimicking the human's eye increased sensitivity to green light. Therefore, the green camera channel contains the least noise and can produce the cleanest key matte mask. Additionally, less light is needed to illuminate green, again, because of the higher sensitivity to green in image sensors. Blue was used as a backdrop before digital keying became common in place because it was necessary for the optical process, but it needed more illumination than green. However, it is also further in the visual spectrum from red, the predominant color in human skin. Though I think I remember hearing that in the film 300 they used a blue background color because it helped highlight their red cloaks better than green would have. Although green and blue are the most common, any color can be used. Red is usually avoided due to its prevalence in normal human skin pigments, but can be often used for objects and scenes which do not involve people. So as you can see, there is a bit of a difference between green and blue screen usage. Thank you again for your question. Thank you all again for joining me in this episode of the Silver Screen Newsroom. I'm Star, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter, like the video, subscribe, and leave comments! This is an interactive show, guys. Leave comments telling me what films you want to hear trivia about or any film-related questions. Come on, people! Dave. Really, man, you need to watch the movie.